turn to section one. You will hear some people talking about getting exercise. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Hey, Yanos, have you seen this notice here? What's that? Join our mall walking program, get fit for free. Now I like the sound of that. I can't afford to keep up my gym membership this term. It's too expensive. Hmm, I know what you mean. But what exactly is mall walking? Sounds a bit boring to me. Hold on. Okay. It may sound boring, but it might be a great opportunity to take exercise.、Mm. Think about it: a climate-controlled environment where you can take exercise without having to worry about the wind or the rain. Wind and rain. <laughs> Have you actually looked at the weather outside? It's snow and ice out there. I only came into the mall to keep warm. Well, it is winter, and we are in Canada after all.、Mm. So just think: by mall walking, we can exercise indoors instead of outdoors. Great. And another thing: we won't have to worry about the traffic. Just think: no busy roads to cross, and no rush hours to think about. Come on, it's worth a try.、Mm. You're still not exactly selling it to me. Imagine walking past the same stores, and they're not even open. So, what's the point of that? Oh, come on, Yanos! Just think about it as an opportunity to window shop and keep an eye out for bargains.、Mm. And what about all the amazing decorations and displays we can take a look at? I think it sounds like fun. <laughs> Did you say fun? <laughs> walking on a hard surface like concrete. Give me grass any day. Much more comfortable on the feet. And there's another thing: in a mall, you're always close to restrooms, and water. Come to that, what could be better than that? I think I know the answer to that one. Exercising in a gym is a whole lot better. Well, anyway, we can get more details at the information kiosk. So, do you want to come with me or not? Uh, I'll give it a miss. I'm off to the gym to make the most of my membership before it runs out. <laughs> Hello, I'd like more information about the mall walking program. Great, we're always looking for new members. Can I just ask you how you found out about the program? Oh,、uh, on the notice board on the first floor. Oh, that's great. Most of our new members come through the website or through friends. Good to know people still read the notice board here in the mall. Yes, I guess so. Now, let me give you some details. The program runs weekdays, Monday through Friday, and it's an early start. Wait for it. Walkers meet at seven a.m. Seven a.m. That is pretty early. But come to think of it, my lectures start at nine most mornings, so I would be able to make it back to the campus in plenty of time. Great. Actually, most members go straight on to work or college after their walk, so you're not alone. Now our members meet here on the ground floor. Here at the information kiosk. No, just over there at the food court. Oh, the food court. Okay. Yes, just follow the smell of coffee. Normally, about ten to fifteen people show up for each walk, but numbers can vary. So up to fifteen in a group. That's an ideal number. Glad it's not fifty. <laughs> And how long do the walks last? You can expect to walk for one hour, but some groups do less. Half an hour or so, and a few groups even do up to an hour and a half. So it's best to check when you arrive. Which day were you thinking of starting? Now you have some time to look at questions eight to ten.
Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Well, next Monday would work for me. Morning lectures have been cancelled, so I would have plenty of time. Monday the 4th of February? Yes, that's right. OK. So let's get your details. Can you give me your full name? Anya Karchevskaya. Can you spell your surname, please? Yes. K-A-R-C-H-E-V-S-K-A-Y-A. And your address? Apartment 12, 2 Burlington Street. And a contact telephone number? 0757 634 5003. I'll just read that back. 0757 634 5003. Yes. By the way, new members receive a free gift when they join, and it's a much better gift than last year. We gave people badges, but they tended to lose them, and more recently we provided visors instead. But they weren't very popular, so this year we're giving new members T-shirts. That's great. What colour? Yellow. I've got plenty in stock, so you can collect yours on Monday. Thanks a lot. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. You will hear a man talking about a parliament building. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning, everyone. Can you all see and hear me? Good. Now, my name's Dan, and I'm your guide this morning for our tour of the New Zealand Parliament. Now, we're standing in the executive wing of the Parliament complex. This is where all the government ministers have their offices and where the Prime Minister and the Cabinet meet. Now, most people here refer to this building as the Beehive and no prizes for guessing why it's called the Beehive. That's right. It's shaped exactly like a traditional Beehive and it's one of the most famous buildings in Wellington. Now, I'll start with some background information about the design and construction of the building. It may come as a surprise for you to learn that the architect wasn't a New Zealander. No. In fact, it was designed by a Scottish architect, Sir Basil Spence. He designed the concept for the building during a visit he made to our city in 1964. His idea was that all the offices and rooms would radiate from a central core. Now, the Beehive was built in stages over ten years. Construction began on building the underground car park and the basement at the end of the 1960s, in 1969. And over the next decade, the remaining floors were constructed. Yes, one decade later, in 1979 the first parliamentary offices moved in. Now, as you can see, the beehive is pretty high. In fact, it's 72 metres tall. It has 10 floors above ground and an additional four floors below. So that's a total of 14 floors altogether. 
That means there's plenty of space for the many facilities available to the members of parliament and ministers to use. These include a small theatre and a television studio. Now, if you'd all just like to follow me, we can make our way inside the building itself. Now you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 18 to 20. Here we are in the entrance foyer. It's a very airy space, isn't it? And if you look at the floor you're standing on, you'll see it's made of marble. And if you look to your left, you can see some beautiful columns. They are also made from marble. Now, look at the wall panels. They are made of stainless steel. They look really stunning, don't they? Now, straight ahead of us is the staircase leading to the first floor of the building. As you can see, the railings on the staircase are made of bronze. Now, let's make our way up this beautiful staircase to the banquet hall on the first floor. And we can admire these beautiful bronze railings on the way. So this is the banquet hall. And as you can see, it's shaped in the form of a semicircle. It's also a pretty big space, isn't it? It's actually a big enough dining room to hold up to 300 guests. Now look at the large mural to your right. It's three-dimensional and shows the atmosphere and sky of New Zealand. And the floor we're standing on is made of wood. It's a native New Zealand timber called tawa. OK, now let's make our way to the... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between a university tutor and a student about a jobs fair. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. OK, Fergus. So we've looked at your assignment, which was OK. Now, before you go, you know about the jobs fair that's coming up, don't you? Yes, it's the week after next, isn't it? The whole week, is that right? That's right. Monday through to Friday. I'd suggest making sure you get along there on Tuesday and Wednesday. Engineering companies tend to be more prominent then, rather than on Monday or the end of the week. Um, yes, I've got the programme for this year, and it looks like those days will be best for me. I'm only in my first year, so I'm not expecting too much from the day. But I've heard you can pick up some valuable ideas for career paths. Well, you've still got a few years here, I know, but it's never too soon to make a good impression on potential employers. 
You've got the programme, so do some research. Have a look at company websites so you've got the basis for a good conversation with the people on the stands. Yes, I was looking at one the other day. The boss was being interviewed about their staff development programme and there are one or two other firms I'm also interested in. Mm, that's good. You've made a start already. Remember to think about what you're going to ask people before you turn up. Not how much you're likely to earn, of course. You only discuss salaries at job interviews. No, questions about the skills you need for the job, the kind of personal qualities employers are looking for, that kind of thing. Yes, I see what you mean. It's best to go prepared and make the most of the opportunities. Mm. And I'm sure you don't need telling that it's a good idea to dress correctly for the event. You need to give off a professional air. Well, I won't be buying anything special for the occasion, that's for sure. I've got a suit and tie at my parents, but I don't have time to collect it. I'll make an effort, though. A nice pair of trousers and a jacket. Nothing too formal. I'm sure you'll look the part. Uh, by the way, you'll often find companies have more than one representative. Maybe someone from marketing handing out free gifts. Someone who'll explain the interview process. An ex-student who now works for them, that kind of thing. Try and direct your questions towards the best person. Yes, that's a good idea. I'd certainly be keen to talk to any ex-students that are around. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. I'm sure you'll find the whole thing really useful. It's important to go to these events and we always get great feedback from students who've attended. As long as you go with the right expectations. It's unlikely you'll come away with the promise of a job, of course. It's more about discovering what companies are looking for in potential employees. Yes. Plus, they're a great opportunity to practice things like networking, meeting new people, talking about yourself and what you do. Do you know what I mean? Definitely, yes. There will be several high-profile companies in the engineering sector, and you'll have the chance to get to know some useful people. If they give you their card or contact information, make sure you keep it safe. It's a sign they like you and want to keep in touch. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Turn to section four. Section four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on archaeology. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 37. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 37. Many thanks for inviting me along today to talk to you about the results of some very interesting recent archaeological research. The saying, you are what you eat, is often applied to present-day dietary advice. 
Certainly, our bodies will show evidence of whether we eat healthily or live on fast food and takeaways. This can be particularly useful in archaeological research. Through a careful analysis of the ancient bones of our ancestors, we can tell a great deal about their diet and the way they lived. I'd like to talk to you today about some research into the early settlers of some remote tropical islands in the Pacific. When these people travelled to these new lands 3,000 years ago, they had to bring along all the resources they needed for survival, including food, plants and animals from their original homes. One such group were the Lapita people, who were early settlers of remote Oceania, several islands in the Pacific. When the Lapita set sail for the island Vanuatu, they brought with them domestic animals and crop plants. This allowed them to settle in an area where no humans had previously lived and that had limited natural resources. Archaeologists have been keen to discover to what extent these settlers and their domestic animals relied on the resources they'd brought with them compared to the native plants and animals they found on the island. In order to try and understand the diet and lives of the Lapita people, archaeologists analysed the chemical composition of the bones of 50 adults excavated from the Lapita Cemetery on Ifate Island, Vanuatu. Depending on what we eat, we consume varying amounts of carbon, nitrogen and sulphur. As these chemical elements are ultimately deposited in our bones, the amounts or ratios of each one can provide a sort of dietary signature. For instance, plants incorporate nitrogen into their tissues, and as animals eat plants and other animals, nitrogen builds up in their own system. The presence of different ratios of chemical elements may show whether a human or an animal ate plants, animals or both. Carbon and sulphur ratios offer another clue to diet. Carbon ratios, for example, differ between land and water organisms, as do sulphur ratios, the values of which are much higher in aquatic organisms compared to land-based organisms. As well as examining the settlers' bones, scientists carried out a comprehensive analysis of the chemical elements found in the settlers' likely food sources. This included modern and ancient plants and animals. They found that early Lapita inhabitants of Vanuatu may have searched for food rather than relying entirely on food they'd grown themselves during the early stages of colonisation. In the longer term, they probably did grow and consume food from the resources they'd brought with them, but early on, they appear to have relied as much on a mixture of fish, marine turtles and fruit bats, as well as their own domestic land animals. Now you have some time to look at questions 38 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 38 to 40. The archaeologists believe that this analysis of diet may also provide clues to the culture of the settlers. For one thing, males had much higher nitrogen levels compared to females, which indicates greater access to meat. This difference in food consumption may support the hypothesis that Lapita societies were ranked in some way or it may suggest dietary differences associated with the work people were involved in. Additionally, the archaeologists analysed ancient pig and chicken bones and found that carbon levels in the settlers' domestic animals indicated that they were eating a diet mainly of plants. However, their nitrogen levels indicate that they may also have roamed freely, eating food such as insects. This would have allowed the Lapita people to keep food resources that were in short supply for themselves, rather than feeding them to their domestic animals. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.